Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm Sandy Potter. Did you know that April is Healthcare Decisions Month? In fact, April 16th, the day after tax day, has been named National Healthcare Decisions Day, which was chosen based on the saying that nothing is certain in life but death and taxes. I'm joined today by a wonderful panel of Masonicare representatives to bring you a virtual panel discussion about the importance of making your end of life choices known. With me are Reverend Carl Anderson, Masonicare's Vice President of Fraternal Relations, Audrey Grove, Director of Masonicare Community Services and Social Accountability, Beverly Brida, Director of Social Work at Masonicare Health Center, and Stacy Allen, Director of Corporate Compliance for Masonicare. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Thanks, Sandy. Thank you. It's a pleasure. This is such an important topic and one that many people might put off talking about because it's not always the most comfortable thing to think about. However, it's very crucial. And, you know, Carl, let's start right there. Why is it so important to make your end of life decisions known to your family members and also to your medical professionals? Well, first, it's very important because if you can't speak for yourself, you want your family to be able to speak in a way that as if you were speaking. This is what I want. This is how I want it done. This is what I don't want done. These are the things that I want you to consider. These are things I don't want you to consider and absolutely do not want under any circumstances. So it's important that you give that to your family and that they have that information. All too often, that, con that conversation has not happened. And then people in, are in a place where I really don't know what to choose or what to do. And as we think about it, the other thing to really consider is the ethics of a person. Are they able to actually fulfill your wishes? If there are things that you want that they ethically have a difficult time with or th they can't speak or really aren't able to speak really for you in a way that you would want them to speak, then you want to think about who could do that for you. I know Bev has talked with families at Masonic Care Health Center many, many times about this topic. And I'm just wondering, Bev, you probably see struggles with families over these issues, I'm sure. Absolutely. Um, many times it's because it, people just haven't had that conversation. So we, um, the families aren't always sure what it is that that person would want. And you're put in a position that you're making really life and death decisions um, and not feeling that you have the um, input from your loved one to help guide that discussion and that decision for you. Um, we see um, many different situations here. Maybe it's a, um, a second marriage. Maybe it's um, children that um, see things very differently so that there's like um, people aren't in agreement with what mom's wishes would be or what would be the best approach to do right now. Um, so we really want to make sure that we have people who um, have had the opportunity to have these discussions with the person before they're in crisis. I think that's really the important piece is have the discussions before you're in crisis so that you're able to talk about the topics. If it does become too sensitive, you could come back and revisit because you're not in crisis. And I think that those are um, you know, really the um, very important factors for the family. A lot of times you find very large families and even though there's a large family, Really, when you talk about it more, there's always that one family member that's been the caregiver. They've taken that mom, they've taken that dad to the doctor's appointments. They know their wishes inside and out. Um, and they do know what the wishes would be, but there's nothing to um, really um, formalize that decision for them and, and to say this is what mom would have wanted. So um, you know, we really want to make sure that we're getting that information back. And I think that the other thing is that... Um, we assume that someone is going to be able to say our wishes, parent our wishes back to our medical team or whatever. And sometimes a person can't do that. So we wanna make sure that, um, you know, that the person that we name to be um, a spokesperson for us really um, can make those decisions and is willing to make those decisions. So um, I think just reaching out that way is really important for us. Absolutely, so important. And, and Audrey, one of the reasons that many people put off going through this process is because it's not always the easiest conversation to have with their loved ones. It's 
not something to bring up over a holiday meal, for example. How can we approach this in a way to make everyone feel more at ease? You know, I think this is really crucial for people. Like you said, the worst time to bring up something like this is sitting around the, the table at Thanksgiving and there's a break in the meal. Oh, by the way, I wanted to talk to you about dot, dot, dot. Find a, a time where you can sit down with your family quietly um, and explain to them that by doing this, you're giving yourself peace of mind. And it's really not only a gift for the person who's expressing their wishes or wants to plan their wishes, it's, it's a beautiful gift to give all of their loved ones. Yes, we always tell everyone this is peace of mind for the whole family. And as Beverly was saying, we suggest not having to make decisions in a time of crisis and preparation is really the key. Stacy, what would you recommend to people who are a little overwhelmed with even starting this whole process? Where can they begin? Right. So it's actually critical, like Bev had mentioned, to memorialize the conversations that you're having with your family. And it can take various forms. So my role here is at Director of uh, Corporate Compliance at Masonic Care includes assisting staff to interpret the advanced directives for our patients and residents. And these are those legal documents prepared while you're able to make decisions for yourself that go into effect when you're not able to do so any longer. And there's two types of advanced directives for healthcare decisions. There's the living will or a set of healthcare instructions. And these state your wishes regarding any kind of healthcare that you may receive. If you have a terminal condition or are permanently unconscious, the living will can also tell your provider whether you want life support systems or not. And the other set is the appointment of the healthcare representative, which is a current Connecticut term. This is that substitute decision maker who you appoint to make medical decisions on your behalf. This includes the withholding of treatment or withdrawal of life support. And again, it only goes into effect when you're not able to make the decision for yourself. Now, Connecticut providers will honor the documents prepared in other states that may have slightly different terminology and we'll do our best to manage them on a case by case basis. You can use the services of an attorney if you wish to help you prepare these documents, but it's not mandatory. You can find these forms if you search on the web, but I recommend using the state of Connecticut approved forms, which are aligned with Connecticut laws and are known to the Connecticut providers who need to use them in guiding your medical care. There are forms are available on the state of Connecticut website if you go to www.ct.gov and search advanced directives. And just so you know, 2011 is the latest update. There are instructions that accompany the forms as well to help you through the process. However, there's another form you may wish to consider, which is called the five wishes document. And this form also satisfies the requirements that I mentioned earlier. I just cannot stress enough the importance of having these documents created and having the conversations with those appointed to act on your behalf so they know what you would like in the event you're not able to express your wishes at that future time. Thank you so much for that great information. And the five wishes document that you brought up is one that we highly rec recommend to all of our residents and patients at Masonic Care. Carl and Audrey, what kinds of things can you put in place when using that? Well, one, number one, and I'm gonna let Audrey talk about the specifics a little bit, but I think the, the thing about the five wishes is it's a nice way to ask the questions. And, and answer the questions. It's a nice approach. You know, Audrey and Bev were both mentioning, you know, approach. And approach is everything. Like you said, Bev, Bev, you know, going back and revisiting. And Audrey, you were saying, you know, not over the Thanksgiving, you know, dinner table or Fourth of July picnic. But to have that discussion, it's a nice way to enter into that conversation and then make sure that in that conversation, in that document, then it's clearly delineated. I would recommend, the other thing is, when you do have these documents, and I know Stacy mentioned, is that you wanna make sure they're available and people know where they are, because that's huge, because all too often people don't know where they are. I know I personally have helped a couple of people where their family has been out of town, 
and I've kept their their documents actually in my glove compartment. And if I needed to go to the hospital and have those documents, I had them right at hand. But as far as the five wishes, is, Audrey, why don't you talk a little bit about what's inside the the, doc, the document? So the five wishes is such a beautiful way for the person who's making these decisions to start thinking about what do I want if it is the end of my life and I can't make the decisions out loud to my family? What do I want my family to know? How I want things to go? And it's very specific. Um, it kind of walks a person through and the family through all kinds of things right down to do I want playing in, um, in the room where I am and what kind of music? It's a great way to approach your family because instead of just a conversation, it's specific facts on paper. And when you can talk about that with your family, but then give them a copy of that so that they can read it over and feel comfortable um, with your wishes. You can access the five wishes document online at Masonic Care, we always have copies, so you can always call community services and we can get that for you. It's a, it's a very easy um, document to access and one that I really recommend looking into. Wonderful, thank you. And we want to remind everyone that completing these documents does not mean that your choices are set in stone. In fact, Beverly, you have great advice about how to approach this on an ongoing basis? So a lot of times we'll see a family member and they're bringing the advanced directives to us and probably it's the first time they've seen it. They know that mom keeps it in the second draw or whatever, but they really haven't looked at it. So they're bringing a document that they, they're not even, people aren't really familiar with. So to me, it's easier when we're working with a family, if I can talk about, this is what your mom wished for you know, 10 years ago and her, her new wishes really haven't changed or this has been consistently what she's been saying throughout her, you know, the time that I've known her. And I think that that helps the family to, to know that in fact they are um, following through on wishes that the person really felt very comfortable with and it wasn't, you know, a, a knee jerk reaction or whatever, that, but really something that that person felt um, consistent with how they viewed their life wishes. So I would recommend that I, I have four D's I call them and it's times that I think we should recommend looking at those documents. So the first D is a decade. I think when we think of, of being 20, we think of life support, maybe we don't even think of a life support. Um, when you're 50, you think of it one way. When you're 60, you think of it another way. When you're 90, you think of it as another way. So certainly every decade. And all I would do is take that document and write on the bottom, Maybe it's my birthday or the week after or whatever. And I'm just going to write down that I looked it over and this is still what I want and just put what today's date is. Another D would be death. Sometimes you need, you name somebody to be your um, healthcare representative and that person passes away. Um, so you need to make sure that it, that, that it is current and that you do have somebody um, valid in that position. Also along with, with death, sometimes, um, Maybe you've just experienced the death of a loved one. Maybe, um, and, and in that process, you think, oh my goodness, I would never want to have that experience. Or, oh my goodness, that was something that was so beautiful, I never thought about it. So you think of things because of your experiences with a very close loss, um, and you find an, either things that you would want or things that you would not want because of what you've just experienced. So looking it over when there's um, the death of somebody significant to you. Looking it over when there's a divorce. Um, you know, you might have named your daughter-in-law or your son-in-law uh, or your wife to be your healthcare representative and healthcare agent. And now that person, um, you know, you're divorced from them. And if that's, you know, if that's still a situation that you're comfortable with having that person in there as your um, responsible party, then that's fine but make sure that you're reviewing that again. And then the fourth one is a time of a diagnosis. Um, you know, we all tend to think that, um, you know, we're not gonna get a terrible diagnosis or that something's not gonna happen to us. 
but you know sometimes you do get that that terrible diagnosis and it does make us take stock in our life and to think about oh my goodness how do i want the rest of my life to be how do i want the end of my life to be so looking that over in terms of diagnosis um and i and covid made me think of it a little bit differently personally this time um you know i've always had the conversations that for me personally I wouldn't want to be on life supports and respirators and things like that. Um, but you know, COVID, there were people on um, what we typically think of as as life supports um, as a as a treatment intervention and not as an end of life intervention. Um, and I did. Um, we, I had an inconclusive test, so I wasn't sure if I was ever going to develop it. Was I not? But I found myself having the conversation with my son. Um, that I know I've always told you one thing, but right now, if I were to get sick, I need you to think differently. You know, so diagnosis certainly is very important. And then Carl said to let people know where the where you have a copy of your information. Um, that's very important. I always tell people also just to take like a little piece of paper or a little note card, put something in your wallet that says you have advanced directives. And a copy of it could be found by calling this number or by going to my draw or whatever it is that you want to put. But having the advanced directives and not having anybody know where they are and how to um, get them isn't very helpful. So I think just keeping a little card right in your wallet is a good way to help you make sure that you're protected. That's it. Wonderful, wonderful advice and tips. Thank you, Beverly. And of course, if anyone has questions or needs a little help getting started with this process, we are here for you. Please feel free to reach out to us at Masonic Care Community Services. That number is 800-982-3919. I wanna thank you all so much for sharing this very vital information. And we thank you for watching at home. Until we see you again, stay well.